dear ladies and gentlemen, Pani Tapanova. And here we are with episode number 36 of our series of conversation with intellectuals in Ukraine and abroad. For those out there who are keen to learn more, think deeper, and hear from the original sources. І ми знову з вами із 36-м випуском нашої серії розмов з інтелектуалами в Україні та за кордоном для тих, хто хоче дізнатися більше, думати глибше та чути з першого джерела. This is a project of Pan Ukraine whose team is continuing their work under the extremely difficult conditions of Russia's continuing war against Ukraine. The war that seems to become a kind of new normal and we can't allow that. Це проєкт «Пан Україна», вся команда якого продовжує свою роботу в надзвичайно складних умовах триваючої війни Росії проти України. Війни, що, видається, в світових новинах набуває статусу нової нормальності, тому не можемо це дозволити. And I have to start with very sad news on Ukrainian poet and writer Volodymyr Vakulenko, who was murdered after being kidnapped by Russian invaders. This became public on November 28 after DNA verification. His body was found in a grave in the Izum woods. According to the police, Russian occupiers shot the writer using a 9mm Makarov pistol. He was a children writer and poet who was kidnapped just because of being Ukrainian on March 24. The occupiers showed him in a bus marked with a Z sign and took off the direction of Izum. None of Bakulenko's relatives had seen him or heard from him since. Before the detention, he decided to bury his war diary under a cherry tree in the garden, fully aware of him. After the, the, the occupation of the Zoom, the writer's diary was transferred to the Kharkiv Literary Museum. He survived by his parents and a son, and I propose to start his, this conversation with a moment of silence for Lovodiv Lunko. Ми розпочали з сумної звістки про українського поета і письменника Володимира Вакуленка, який був убитий після викрадення російськими окупантами. Про це стало відомо 28 листопада після перевірки ДНК. Його тіло знайшли в могилі в Ізюмському лісі. І, за даними поліції, його було розстріляно з 9-мм пістолетом Макарова. Володя був дитячим письменником і поетом, якого російські окупанти викрали 24 березня. Його заштовхали в автобус із знаком Z і виїхали в напрямку Ізюма. З тих пір ніхто із родичів Володі не бачив і не чув про нього. Перед затриманням він вирішив закопати свій щоденник під вишною у саду, прекрасно розуміючи, що за ним прийдуть. Після деокупації Ізюма щоденник письменника було передано до Харківського літературного музею. У Володимира Вакуленка залишились батьки та син. Ми розпочали цю розмову з хвилини мовчання. Thank you for joining us today, and our project is co-hosted by Pan International, which has continued to provide a platform for freedom of expression for those currently under the highest risk. The project is implemented with the support of the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine, and our traditional partners are Pan America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, Local History, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, and the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. We broadcast today's event to all partners' Facebook pages. Співорганізатором є міжнародний план, який продовжує надавати платформу для свободи вираження поглядів тим, хто перебуває у групі найвищого ризику. Нагадую, що наш проєкт втілюється за підтримки посольства США в Україні і нашими традиційними партнерами є Пан Америка, Український інститут, Український інститут Лондона, Україна світ, локальна історія, Український науково-дослідний інститут Гарвардського університету та інститут Гаріману при Колумбійському університеті. Ми транслюємо сьогоднішню подію на всі партнерські сторінки у Фейсбуку. Захід відбуватиметься англійською мовою. 
and I will switch it to English to introduce myself and our today's guest. My name is Olga Mucha, and I'm a manager in Pan International and proud to be a member of Pan Ukraine. And I am honored to introduce our today's guest. First of all, it's Olesya Ostrovska Luta. She's an Ukrainian art manager and curator. Thank you for joining us today. And she's the director of one of Europe's largest art museums, the Mstetsky Arsenal, National Museum Complex for Arts and Culture in Kyiv, who notably hosts the Kyiv Arsenal Book Fair. She has previously served as Ukraine's deputy minister, working also on the Ukraine National Committee on UNESCO, for UNESCO. And since the invasion, you've continuously voiced the reality of this intention to use this war to destroy cultural institutions, right to erase the national identity and existence of Ukraine. And in this context, uh, you recently wrote, Alessia, on the significance of the concept of inheritance, the both of professional and cultural value in creating meaning to one's existence. And you uh, allude to Milan Kundera's book, right? The Unbearable Lighters of Being, and how the destruction of Ukraine's cities and culture are removing those things which give one the sense of ground under their feet. And I think this is a very important statement to discuss today with Dan. I will be, it will be very interesting to hear your perspective on Ukrainian identity and the role of cultural heritage in protecting democracy and the global consequences of war. And Olesya will be holding the dialogues today with Dan Ariely, an Israeli-American researcher in behavioral economics and currently the professor of psychology and behavioral economics at Duke University. He's the author of best-selling books, Predictably Irrational. I hate this online format because I can sign it. <laughs> and The Upside of Irrationality that dove into his research in our decision-making and irrational behaviors. Within you, your search, you questioned human behavior and why we act in certain ways and how we make decisions, looking at what truly motivates our actions. And I think that was one of the really mm, hitting questions at the very beginning of this invasion. Why? A lot of people are still asking, why? What is the reasoning of all of this nonsense happening in 21st century? And... Often in your answers, you are uncovering surprising results. Let's say, let's see if we can find out something today. And in focusing on dishonesty and lying, you found that there remains a strong link between moral codes and greater honesty, and that reminders of morality can have an effect on behavior. Also, those research can provide us, I believe, some insights on, into Russia's aggression, propaganda warfare, and the behavior of people in war times. During previous dialogues, we often spoken on the resistance of Ukrainians and their behavior of intense of solidarity. Perhaps you may also have some insights into this type of behavior and motivation in the context of war, too. So having dialogues between guests such as yourself, who come from distinctive disciplines, often lead to new perspectives and possibilities. This concept of Russia aggression and destructive aims and dishonest behavior will be jumping off points of our conversation. So I'm switching off and going to enjoy, I believe, a lot of insights. If you have any questions, our dear viewers, please Ask them in the comments under our translations. Thank you. Dan, the floor is yours. Okay, so it seems like we were given a, a great uh, task with uh, very high, uh, very high expectations. Um, I, I usually perform better with low expectations, but let's uh, let's try. Um, so let's uh, let's start with kind of my uh, curiosity about. Uh, what is happening on the ground uh, right now. And, you know, I, I read the, the, the New York Times as my uh, source of what is going on. So I know some of the uh, depiction of what's going on. So my, but my question to you is more about how do you see the psychology uh, of, of yourself and people around you? Uh, this has been going for a long time. Uh, what is happening to resilience, to hope? Uh, camaraderie, um, what, what is your sense of what is going on? Well, thank you for the question, and I'm happy to be 
here talking to you today and uh, to all the people that are watching. Um, you know, what's my greatest concern right now? It's uh, having light electricity on. And that is probably a picture that uh, describes how we live right now. Because after uh, Russian missile strikes since this October, there have been severe shortages of electricity, something we've never, never uh, experienced. Uh, and now we adapt to living in between um, electricity shortages. And there was quite a lot of effort put into to, to, tonight's conversation because it's evening in, um, in Kiev and I'm speaking from Kiev. So um, there was quite some effort, organizational effort put into this conversation to be able to catch electricity. So actually, uh, colleagues from Pan-Ukraine proposed to come to their office to make sure that uh, we can uh, have a conversation because they have uh, a generator. But um, on the other hand, it turns out that at the moment I do have light in my office. I'm staying in Art Arsenal where I work right now, and there is no light in Pan-Office because those things are unpredictable in Kiev right now. So if Lights uh, go very dim. Um, I still hope to be online, but with with less light later on, or maybe not, maybe not. So, what's um, why? You know what? Am what I... uh, to 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 um, so so you know I I um, uh, much much uh, uh, dramatically uh, tinier tragedy, but um, when I was injured. Um, I was in hospital for a very long time, and about three years. And um, in the beginning, I had no thoughts about the future. And there's this uh, psychologist called Melsek who studied pain, and he coined the term pain people. And what he means is that at a certain level of need, in, in this case pain, uh, people don't think about anything else. Uh, there's no, there's no future. There's no. You just focus on the, the challenges of the, <laughs> of the moment. And I remember very strongly uh, that uh, that period. And what you're describing reminds me this sense that at the moment there's something that is just so, so occupying. Uh, it it exactly. it just becomes the the center of your your existence. And then the other thing psychologically that that you're mentioning is the unpredictable nature of it. And, you know, when we think about stress, we think about two types of stress. Um, some of us, we have stress from work. Oh, there's so many things I need to do, I'm stressed. That's, that's a stress that actually doesn't affect us that badly. The stress that affects us very badly is the stress in which we feel helpless, in which, you know, stress at work, it's still under your control. Uh, stress not at work is you know, from things that are coming from other places is are the conditions in which uh, things are outside of your control and they not only create stress, but they also negatively affect the immune system. Well, and, have... and yeah, go ahead. I, let me just say one last thing. Um, and in the, in the last two, two and a half years, uh, in, in very different ways, I've also been uh, very interested and curious about uh, the world of fake news and misinformation. And one of the things I've learned is that uh, when you have stress of the kind of the world is unpredictable, uh, we all want to explain things to ourselves. We're looking for a story to describe what is going on. And that story actually opens the door for um, conspiracy theorists or for, for misinformation. It is so hard to live with the ambiguity of not knowing where things are coming that we just try to find the story, figure out things, and then much more likely to go into a conspiracy or misinformation. Well, I guess we've in in the Ukraine we've come up with a story, and that story is about our uh, re resilience and resistance. And actually, this is a positive story, rather. I have to tell you that I have your book here as well. I read it too. Um, 
But um, what I wanted to add to what you've just said, it's not the helpless feeling that you are um, that you have living in Kiev or other parts of Ukraine. Why I mentioned the dim light, which can you know uh, dominate my screen, is because I do have two lamps, and this is uh, here, and this is what happens to most people uh, all around Ukraine. We are very busy. Uh, arranging our living conditions with lamps and generators and all sorts of eco flow um you know systems and things like that so there is no i don't think that you asked about resilience and solidarity in ukraine i don't think there is a feeling of helplessness uh by the way some of all. the things some of the things you're describing uh, are what we would prescribe against the feeling of helplessness. Uh, having lights, I mean, basically, um, every time that something is, is out of our control, uh, the best solution is to try and gain some control over it. Yeah. And a lot of what you're describing is about, uh, is about gaining, gaining some control. And also as a civilian in, in Ukraine, you are very much connected to Ukrainian army because there are many friends in the army. And actually, Ukrainian army is very much a part of Ukrainian society. And Ukrainian army is winning. So taking control, doing something, uh, which again adds to the feeling uh, of being resilient and to having control over your uh, your life. There is, I, I would say there is a quite a significant feeling of pride which manifests in many many jokes all around uh, around social media of course uh, and one of the jokes is that um, Putin is bombarding uh, Ukrainian um, electricity uh, professionals and losing so those are um, those are jokes that actually help you to cope with that. And I also wanted to relate to something you said earlier. You said that when you are in pain, uh, you, perhaps psychologically as well, you cannot imagine the future. And this is exactly what was my experience this um, March in Kiev. And it was time which is called Battle for Kiev. So it's it was time when there were Russian troops around Kiev. Um, and for for a person staying in Kiev at that time, um, there was an interesting effect which I noticed. I realized that I suddenly have many recollections from my past, from my childhood, very vivid, uh, very colorful sometimes, sometimes even with the, with the smell or uh, things like that. And I thought, why? Why is that? And my answer to myself was that the reason why this, those recollections are so vivid is that I cannot imagine the future. So all the energy goes into um, imagining the past. And the moment you, what do you do when you realize that you, one of the, one of the um, therapy, you know, uh, very, very, um, um, intuitive therapists, which you can do to yourself, would be to write a text about that. Uh, but then secondly, this is actually what cultural scene is doing, because in, on the cultural scene, people discuss things and people imagine things. This is one of the most important, uh, probably uh, one of the most important things that you can do on the cultural scene. And then I also thought that culture literature or visual arts, museums, anything is very useful in this situation because they before, have before to we, project. Before we, uh, so, so that's a very interesting, uh, very interesting theory about, you know, the past and what you direct energy. Uh, b before we go to cultural symbols, I, I want to ask you something about resilience. So, so my my sense of resilience is that resilience is kind of an insurance policy. So uh, do you know the term secure detachment? No. Okay, so imagine a parent and that parent goes with their kids to the playground and the parent says to the kid, go and play. And the kid goes and they play and uh, they come back 20 minutes later. 
If you've achieved doing that, you created a kid with secure attachment. On the other hand, if the kid turns around every two minutes, kind of just around, just to see if you're still, if you're still around, then you haven't managed uh, to create a kid with secure attachment. And, and secure attachment is really running around life with the sense that if something bad would happen, somebody would catch you. And uh, we get it from people around us. Uh, we get it from uh, the way our parents uh, developed it. And, and, and of course, uh, being under war uh, can create the conditions for people to realize with, with greater intensity that other people are there to help them. If you think about what the, the conditions uh, the conditions for this, this are. By the way, when inequality increases uh, in a country or in a neighborhood, uh, what do you think happens to resilience? It goes down. Why? Because when inequality increases, people are less likely to ask each other for help. They, they, they feel they're more alone. So, so inequality uh, basically created conditions in which people don't feel comfortable asking. So, so I wanted to ask you about um, what is happening to, to resilience from that, uh, from that sense? Uh, are people um, extending their social networks? Are people realizing that there are more people they can rely on? Are people uh, more likely to help others? What's happening on that, on that front? Have you heard about this thing that we call, call volunteer movement in Ukraine? A little bit. This is probably the most um, significant uh, social phenomenon that we see right now. Um, everyone is doing something to win and everyone is connecting with someone else to do that. So to give you an example, uh, again, during the Battle of Kiev, when we had to suspend our usual work at the art arsenal, usual operation, but we still had to uh, to be here to um, to do whatever we could to protect it, some of my colleagues they started they feel that they need uh, they need more action to protect and to care for others that they basically became 100% volunteers providing all sorts of things to other people. Um, other people just stayed physically in the museum uh, night and day, and they felt that was their uh, duty to protect things and that was this is probably the new norm in ukraine at the moment and one of the um uh, sources of pride how we know that we are that we are winning as we say right that um, many people are connected in millions of networks to to help refugees to help the army very much to a great um, extent to um to keep Ukrainian voice on the uh, international area loud and many other um, things. So I would say that what you are saying about um, secure detachment, right? And the, um, the um, sources of resilience, this is more or less what you can see within the um, society. Even when you had, um, when the, the invasion started on February 24. Many people fled from Kiev to Western regions. And at the beginning, so many people um, invited complete strangers to their houses, to their places, and shared what, what they had to support each other. That was very important because that helped people to feel that we can, we can overcome it and we can um, actually um, win this war as, as a mass of people. But this is not the first time. This is also the phenomenon of Ukraine's Maidans. Um, there were a few mass protest movements in 2004 and 2014, both in winter time. And in winter time, you need many people to gather, to get resources, you know, to stay in a cold place uh, over the night. So that was a familiar pattern, how to deal 
but a very grave situation. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a sad statement to think about uh, how sometimes humanity shows its best face when we're in trouble. Right. If you if you think about uh, people's willingness to to help each other and collaborate and, and and work together, it's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing that it happens under time of need. It's also a shame that it doesn't happen uh, more often when when there's no uh, when there's no need. Um, but how how are you looking at things forward? Uh, this has been going on for for quite a while now. Uh, but what's the, your prognosis for how things will develop moving from here forward well, from the very beginning even even though you're focusing if, even though you're focusing right now electricity for today i'm trying to get you to think a bit more long term are, are you how long are you expecting this to to go on how long do people have the energy to keep on to keep on fighting well, it's hard to say, but this has been a very long um, war already. It's it's taking more than eight years so far, as, and then the full scale invasion. Yeah. Um, but there is a huge determination that uh, people have to stand as long as needed, because otherwise there is a negative motivation for it. We mentioned Volodymyr. Vakulin at the very beginning, but this is the um, one of the fears also on the uh, cultural scene that this the, this is what may happen to any cultural figure and any uh, anyone active in social life on political scene as well. So you can uh, can't um, you, you know you can't lose because you will be erased. And since the prospect of being erased is quite grave, so there is a huge determination. And I think people will resist as long as it takes. But I also wanted to ask you um, something I read in your uh, book, and that suddenly, and this is something we are talking about right now. Um, and this is um, what you describe as, um, as the situation when people doing social service uh, work much harder than people who get paid for doing good things, right? Yeah. There was a, 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 a quite a serious conversation in Ukraine about international charity bodies, how they failed and how they are really unable to help in certain situations, unlike the volunteer networks that I mentioned before. And then when I wrote, when I read your book, I thought that this is an explanation. Someone who is a very good person doing very good thing and get uh, things and gets paid uh, for it doesn't go the same length as someone who does things as social service. Is that? Yeah. So, so it, it is, it is true that what, what is happening is that uh, ext what we call extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation are very different and they don't add up. So in a very, very simple, uh, uh, so, so simple way that it's a little bit offensive, but uh, imagine somebody asked you for a favor. Uh, somebody asked you to um, help them change the tire on their car. If you say, hey, you know, I have a flat tire, would you help me change a flat tire? Uh, how likely would you be to help? Uh, condition number two, somebody says, hey, I have a flat tire, would you help me for $3? What, what is very apparent is that people are happy to help for free. They're not happy to help for $3. So the $3 is not free plus $3. You don't say to yourself, I, I get to help this person plus I get $3. That's better than just helping. What happens is the moment money comes into the, the situation, we start framing it as work. And the moment we frame it as work, the boundaries are uh, becoming more clear. And there are some things we don't do. We don't do it work. So, so there is there is a real challenge um, of, of what gets people to be fully, fully committed, and can what are the conditions in which work can actually undermine, undermine that. Um, but by the way, there's probably more reasons than just that. So, for example, as we know, bureaucracy is increasing. And people can't always do what they want, and they have lawyers, and they have, you know, the, the world. The world is becoming a, a world of 
run by bureaucrats and lawyers. Like I can imagine somebody who's unbelievably committed and, and work for something, but they work in an organization and the organization said, you can't do this even if you, if you want to. So I think partially it could be explained by intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, but there are probably other, uh, other factors um, as well. The, the other thing that we find in, in intrinsic motivation, that something very important is to, we call it utility embracing. It's not a good name, but, but here's the idea. Uh, imagine that you do a particular job. Um, you're responsible for art in a particular uh, place. Um, the reality is that in many cases, what we want you to do, what the, what the organization wants you to do is not to do your job description. The organization wants you to look around and say, where else can I help? Especially the things you were describing, right? People say, oh, you know, my job description is this, but right now I should be protecting the art. Right now I should be staying here late at night. Right now I should do, do something else. And it's true in time of war, but it's true in all times that what we really want is to, is to look around and to say, where else can we help the, the organization? And, and the more organization become procedurals and bureaucratic, uh, the less likely they are to get that, right? So what you want is you want a nimble organization. You want an organization that from the top gives autonomy to everybody to, to do what they think is right at that moment, right? You're in the field, you're the person, look around, see what you think is the most, the, the right thing to do right now and go ahead and do it. If an organization doesn't give people though that level of autonomy and trust, then it's unlikely to, uh, to translate people. Say, oh, it's not in my job description. Uh, I'm, I'm not doing it. And even though something is very clear, there's a lot of help and so on. So that's another thing that makes organizations that are very procedural and bureaucratic, unable to, to respond to a situation um, which is, you know, not, not standard, uh, not standard days. Well, um, there was, there was something else that you, that you said that I think is, is, is very important, which is about the feeling that they're trying to erase the culture. And, and you know, the, the, there is, there is a sense, a very important and elusive sense in which legacy is very important. Um, I, I ask people to imagine uh, what would happen uh, when they die, if when we die, everything about us would be erased. So imagine you put yourself into this mindset. And I said, the moment that you die, of course, all social media is, is eliminated. That's easy to imagine. But nobody would remember you. And nobody from, imagine that was how things worked. Of course it's not, but just imagine that would work. Nobody would have a memory of you, none of your, your kids. There would be nothing. Like the moment you disappeared, it, it will be all over and there will be no memory. And I asked people to think about what kind of motivations would they have? And, and um, basically people have much lower motivation. And it's a kind of a strange thing because you say, oh, we're alive now, we'll be dead. What, why do we care? But we do care. Uh, the reality is that human psychology is not just about the moment. It's not just about what we get now. It's also about our legacy. And we think about it in all kinds of non-concrete, non-concrete way, but, but legacy is incredibly important. And the moment somebody is threatening uh, to eliminate that legacy, uh, the stakes become much, much, much higher. And, and you might say if you have kind of a more practical mechanistic view of life, you would say you're alive, then you're dead. Why do you care what happens when you're dead? The answer is, <laughs> if we were rational, maybe we wouldn't, but we're not, right? This is one of the uh, irrational doesn't always mean bad. Ir irrational means that we care about love and poetry and art and, and legacy and all kinds of things that are not part of the rational framework. But we do, we do care about this. And I think that the threat on, on legacy uh, creates a much bigger, much bigger threat than a threat to just say, you know, you're going to get injured or you're going to die. There's something much more intense about this idea of annihilation 
of everything connected to to legacy. Well, actually, what you are saying brings me to a thought about um, uh, about living in an abusive state. And uh, we lived in Soviet Union. Russia is in an abusive state as well. And what happens? What happens at least to people living in Soviet Union? Um, to, there was a saying that the most important thing is your family. Your family is the, the only thing that matters because your family was the only place where probably where you could keep your legacy because otherwise you cannot, you could not uh, really affect the public sphere because public sphere belongs to the state. So you, your legacy could not live in the public uh, sphere. You could not change the, pol uh, the political and social fabric to some extent. So the only thing that you could transform, change, or make a better one is your family. And on one hand, it feels very, uh, very human and warm. On the other hand, this is what breeds corruption, I guess, because this is only a very small circle of people that matter. So people only want to uh, to bring something durable and good to a small uh, circle. Would you agree to that? Yeah, that's, I've never thought about it this way, uh, but I think it is it is very interesting. So both the connection to, you know, what happens, you know, what happens to motivation and when we allow people to create something in the public sphere, uh, both art and companies and inventions and so on and what happens when we when we take it away from people what's the motivation that is that is left i think that's very, that's that's one one interesting thing right what to some degree i think a lot of the attempts people have to create a lot is is connected to legacy maybe it's not just about legacy but it's also also legacy and i think your connection to corruption uh, is also very interesting. If I have to uh, to put effort into something that will stay longer uh, after I stay, but I can't do anything to anybody else, that then the only option I have is is to do it on 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 immediate on the immediate family. Um, it also it also creates less collaboration. If you think about um, big projects. Uh, by necessity creates collaboration. So they create the recognition of the importance of other people in our lives, right? You need, you need people to, to do whatever you want to invent something. Or, but, but the moment, the moment you can't do anything in public life, then also the notion of collaboration gets diminished and you're just left with, with the selfish, uh, motivation. Um, and, and you know, all of this, I, I had a discussion many years ago with somebody from the Philharmonic uh, and, and they asked me, how, how can I help them uh, raise more money for the, for the Philharmonic uh, Orchestra? And I gave them some, some advice. Um, but, but one of the things I asked them, I said, you know, why don't you try and figure out uh, the impact that music has on the lives of people. Um, you know, you can, you can just get people who care to give you more money. Uh, we, we know how to do that. But I said, why, why don't you try and figure out more holistically the role of music and the role of art in, in people's lives? And, and they were quite offended, I have to say. Uh, they felt offended that they had to explain to somebody something that was for them was self-evident say, Oh, I don't want to explain it. Why do I need to explain it? It's, uh, it should be self-evident. People should just support the art. And I said, look, I, I don't think people should just support science or social science or my social science. I think people should, we should give people reasons uh, for doing that. And maybe it's your role to, to give those reasons. And, and I think that, what you're describing here is uh, probably the most interesting uh, reasons uh, to bring to to bear. Now it's true that they come up in in a time where there's a real there's a real threat. But um, how do we think about 
legacy and how do we think about the continuity of the culture and how do we think about something that uh, unites us and connects us to uh, history and um, how do we think about collaboration uh, and, and defining uh, what society uh, would be and 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 all of these uh, thoughts maybe make me want to ask you a, a tough question which is imagine that after seeing what you're seeing now and about the, the importance uh, of of art and culture uh, you got to re-envision what art and culture would look like for for ukraine in in 10 years from now um you're in charge and what what kind of things would you do differently if you said look i i now understand the the role of art and culture in a different way and i want to supersize it i want to maximize it i want it to be even even stronger uh, what would you do differently well, I think this is one of the questions we've been asking ourselves here um, in my institution and in, uh, among the friends all, um, all the way through Russian invasion. Why do you, because this is something you said, just let me make a small digre uh, digression. You said something about an organization, which I would describe as a good organization, where uh, people... Um, kind of know why they exist and then they have freedom and th that was something i learned through this year that for an organization under an ex enormous stress such as war it's important to keep focus on the mission of this organization understanding why it exists and this is the role of the leadership and then all the all the rest of the team members they need to have freedom to act freely depending on the circumstances because no one knows what specific circumstances can be in such a situation so it's just impossible to plan and control therefore you have to trust but to trust you need to keep the vision why why do you exist why do people have to uh to risk sometimes to, and uh, living in uh, uh, Ukraine is connected to a certain amount of risk right now. So why do people have to risk living um, in Ukraine or places like Kherson uh, uh, liberated the city that has been has just been liberated? Why would you send a museum worker there? Right, uh, it's a risky place. So you need to know, to understand why you exist, and this is something we've been we've been discussing a lot all through the year uh, and i have few answers which which I, which i um actually i've been um repeating them a lot so i will do it again one of the answers is this cultural organizations if we talk about culture but uh, um this is just my experience at this moment adds to resilience of the society it's it, it serves as a place where people can get together where people can speak about their experience, where people can share their experience. And that's important. That's hugely important. This is something we learned after Russians retreat from Kiev. We all wanted to talk. And we we were very loud. We spoke far too, too much to describe uh, our experiences. So we created an exhibition about that. And then we found out that our visitors they actually also wanted to talk. That was a very funny situation. Just at the beginning, we created an exhibition called Exhibition About Our Feelings. And it was basically about what we feel right now. And um, after the first curatorial tour given by my colleague was uh, who created that exhibition, she took people around the exhibition, the visitors. And after the tour finished, she went outside, out of the uh, gallery. And she thought she's dumb. But uh, all those people from the tour, they came out with her and started to tell her about their experiences. So uh, that, then we thought it was a good thing because this exhibition, this project adds to the, re the, the resilience to the people who can express what happens, to, who can share what happened to them. And there is another thing, one more thing, what, what we do now 
why this culture it's uh, actually it applies to the future what cultural uh, organization or any cultural um i don't know um thinking should be about i think it's pretty much about resilience of communities of larger groups not just one person but it's also about imagining because as as we started uh, at the beginning uh, it's very hard to imagine and think about future once you are in pain and the only way uh, not the only way but what helps you imagine is for example something on the cultural um, scene sometimes yeah. it's uh, it can go into absurdity of course but it's still about imagining that's another thing that that uh, relates to what this philharmonic that you mentioned should be doing in a, yeah. um, ideally I think, I think i think what you're also saying is that it's the it's kind of the uh, the battlefield of um ideology and identity and you say you know as a society we 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 move forward in all kinds of ways but we want something to help us understand our our heritage our legacy our identity our ideology and and maybe maybe we need we need something to help us um work on that on that front as well um i want to i want to switch uh, topics um you know the I don't know how you feel about how the the world has been treated the war um the, the invasion uh, my sense is there was about you know I don't know 10 days of um high involvement and then things have uh, dropped off I don't know if you feel that the world has abandoned um Ukraine or to at least some degree um uh, what what's your sense on on uh, how much you get support how much you're alone uh, and and why well it's now enough uh, of support of course but no this is the first time probably since the last more than 100 years that uh, we as a society and i think there is a consensus uh, in the society that we do have allies or at least partners, and that we are hurt with our own voice as a society, which has never happened uh, before. And um, this pattern of Russian invasion is very familiar to every Ukrainian because this is something which has been happening uh, more than once already, all through the 20th century. For example, um, most of Ukrainian writers that... Uh, wrote uh, in the 2020s, 100 years ago, uh, were executed at the beginning of the 30s, um, just during a very short period of time. So there was almost uh, no writers on the uh, cultural scene. And with the Russian invasion, when the Russian invasion started, there was a memory which was very, very alive in the um, head of the literary community, for example, and more than that. And then uh, also the whole, whole phenomenon in the um, whole art phenomena of the 20s were totally erased in 30s. The artists were executed. There was one phenomenon, very important uh, neo-Byzantine movement, modernist neo-Byzantine movement called Bouchukism, where authors were executed and their their artworks those were huge murals were destroyed physically so this uh, circle of destruction was very familiar and very expected and again that uh, brings us to the legacy i'm, I'm afraid we, we couldn't change the topic uh, so that, that brings us back to that question the but, but you felt but you felt um you you, you... You, feel, you think that people are feeling heard and, and supported by the much rest more, of the world? Much more, much more, much more. For example, uh, German um, parliament just adopted an act um, admitting that Ukrainian uh, Holodomor, there was death by hunger, is an act of genocide. 
you couldn't imagine it 10 years ago, even five years ago. It's a huge change in international politics. And that's a symptom of being hurt much better than before. Uh, that's that's actually very impressive that that you're giving this example. You know, I was um, expecting to to think about help on the ground, uh, but mm -hmm. but you're 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 talking about moral uh, recognition uh, in a, in a much better way. And it connects very much to your question about you know is is your voice being heard? Are you uh, this this. Uh, is, is this war recognized as, as an atrocity? By real people, that's the question yeah. that we are going through. And this is something Ukrainians have been denied for a very long time. There were the decrees in, uh, in 19th century in Tsarist Russia prohibiting usage of uh, Ukrainian language. Uh, so you couldn't have Ukrainian language in public sphere. And that, that just explains this chain of events. And uh, you are not doubting that Ukrainian language exists, do you? So yeah. <laughs> that's seen as a, as a progress because about 20 years ago, when I was in a museum in Switzerland, a curator in this museum was very much su surprised to find out that there is such a thing as Ukrainian language. Really? So I would say there is, a, uh, there is a strong progress in terms of um, being able to speak from yourself. And this is something that Ukrainians feel now. Speaking about um, so, in some, about in some sense, in some sense, you feel that there's a, a, a lot has been gained already. That's much um, more than uh, than than we had before, right? Yeah. But uh, let me just give you one more example. You know, I like still, I still want, I still, still want this war to be over soon. By the way, <laughs> um, it is, it is, yeah. um, you know, the, nobody the, wants it more than Ukrainians. Believe yeah, me. Yeah. No, I know. So um, just uh, as a humanitarian uh, help, which you asked about, um, imagine when the uh, invasion started, Poland opened its border to Ukrainian citizens to flee, and you could you could flee without a passport, with your with your cats and dogs, without any documents, which was unprecedented um, uh, sign of solidarity. So we appreciate it very much, but. Uh, of course, we need much more military support, and that's a very consen uh, There is a strong consensus on Ukrainian society. When I was asked just about a month ago um, by politicians in Germany, what do Ukrainian culture need now to get better uh, protection? And I would uh, that that sounds a little bit like bravado, but. That's true. We need air defense systems so that missiles do not hit our um, buildings and heritage sites. The yeah, being being hurt by missiles is is another one of those uh, elements with a um, very high level of unpredictability. If you think about the the Blitz in London, uh, for example, just just having. Uh, missiles hit in un unpredictable time and location. Um, very, very. Uh, it, it really shakes you to the core in terms of your uh, ability to uh, to move uh, to move forward. The fear is just very high. Um, if we take if we take the day to day life now, and we take what you thought two years ago about how it would feel like to live under you know such attacks um, are you surprised with how much people in general have gotten used to it you know there, there's this uh, really interesting force called adaptation <laughs> where we we get used to good things which is sad but we also get used to bad things which is which is a great protection um, so you know, you describe uh, getting, uh, you know, being f filled with worrying about electricity. But are there things that you feel that you got used to, adapted to, and that surprise you? Like two years ago, you would say, "I, I, I don't think anybody could get used to that." Uh, well, I think that people and uh, me, myself personally, and other people uh, around got adapted to 
to unimaginable, uh, un unimaginable things. But um, this is something I noticed during COVID time, uh, when COVID started. People who were a little bit slightly older, because they're still young, but slightly all older, meaning people who lived through, through Ukrainian 90s, after the collapse of Soviet Union, were quite adaptable because they had the experience of living in a very uh, in a very volatile situation. For example, uh, when I was um, very young and just started my career, I remember when when you had to purchase something for an artistic project, you had to call the shop every day to find out the price because price changed daily. So having remembered that. You get you are, you get very tolerant to vol, uh, volat volatility. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, remembering this uh, this tolerance for volatility, I think I would Im I could imagine that people can adapt to things. And there is also a quote which I love from a Ukrainian avant-garde futurist artist of the beginning of twentieth century, the David Burluk, who famously said. A man is not a louse, he can adapt to anything. So um, this is uh, quite pretty much about that as well. But I had a question to you actually about that thing. Um, what happens to people who gradually adapt to worse and worse and worse condition? Um, is, is there, is there um, a risk of collapsing just because you get to adapt to things so so adaptation do have do have limits um but it's it's basically you know the the our mind is looking around the world and noticing things that are novel and then uh, because of that uh, we we look at, at at novel anything that is above our standard level but when the standard level changes uh, we just don't pay attention to that anymore. So if you think about, uh, imagine electricity. Like you said. If electricity turns off at different times of day, it will be a little harder to get used to it. But, but if it was always between 10 a.m. at noon, uh, it will take some time to get used to it, but then, then people get, get adapted. And once they get adapted, they find all kinds of mechanisms to cope with it. It stops being as big of an issue. Now, it doesn't mean that life is better uh, with, with less electricity in the same way that life is not better with, with more pain, but, but we, we, do get, uh, we do get used to it. But the question is, can it become part of the background? And part of the background just means that we stop paying attention to it as much and we, we, we get used to it. And it, it's both a gift and a curse, right? On the, on the happy side, we get used, like look at this. Uh, we get used to beautiful scenery uh, and we get used to lots of things. And, and, uh, but then, but then we, we do get used to, uh, to bad things. And, and in most cases, uh, our speed in adaptation is surprising to people. If you think about all the things that we do to uh, not go downhill in any in any way, um, we do lots of effort. We don't understand the degree to which we could adopt and get and get used to things. By the way, uh, this is in no way just says we should take on bad things. It, it's obviously better not to have them, but it, it is the case that we get used to things faster than we think. And because of that, some things that we are afraid of are not as actually frightened, frightening in reality as we fear because we do get, uh, we do get used to them. Um, so, so really, really a, a kind of a strange, a strange mix of our psychology. And our lovely host has joined us probably tell us that we're yeah i know i hate those moments when i need to interrupt and thank you so much what a guide on psychology from both sides i would say and my apologize on high expectations but you overgrown <laughs> them anyway so i have a question basically for dan we have one of our regular viewers 
who is asking you, how do you can how can you explain that Ukrainians who are abroad are more explosions than those who hear and see them in Ukraine? Are those adaptive abilities of the brain which stops panicking or maybe all negative feelings accumulate and over time the trauma will appear and in which form? Yeah, so um, so this, this goes back to what we just discussed about, about adaptation. Um, you know, so I, I grew up in Israel and there was a period in which uh, there were lots of explosions and uh, terrorist attacks and the buses exploding in Israel and uh, and in the beginning it was very worrisome and then we got used to it and when we went out uh, the discussions were about do you sit in the front or do you sit in the back right people had different theories about um, uh, what it is now if you think about those theories uh, they were important because they were a, a way to try and gain some control Right. So if I go to a restaurant and say, oh, if a terrorist come, they will uh, explode in the opening of the restaurant. So in the back, this or if they come in, I can leave, you know, whatever theory you have, it's the theory allows some sense of control and, and choosing deliberately. Like it's not that you go to a restaurant and say, oh, you sit here. The, the choice, the choice is is important. So. So, again, we, we do get used to atrocities. Uh, to some degree, not not fully, um, but we also need control. And if you think about uh, people who are experiencing uh, the challenges, um, then then they have more control. People who are from far away, they have they are they're helpless. Uh, it's it's a it's a I don't want to say it's a tougher situation because it's not because, but our psychological system is not being recruited uh, to help us. Um, also, you know, there's something about experiencing things that get you to also see the the humanity of it. Like think about um, almost almost any everything we've talked about was kind of in a, in a very uh, strange way the positive sides of war. Right, we talked about increased resilience and people helping each other and recognizing the value of culture and uh, finding strength. So we talked about lots of lots of positive things. If you, you're from a Ukraine heritage, but you sit in in London, uh, you don't get any of those positive things. You don't get the extra uh, resilience, and you don't get the to see your neighbors uh, helping each other. So so it's Again, I, it, it's, it sounds terrible to say that there are also a positive thing in such a terrible situation, but, but, but there are these positive, positive things and you don't get to experience them. So if you're, if you're far away, you only get to, to worry and you don't get to see the positive side and you don't get the benefits of uh, adaptation and you don't get um, the feeling of control. And if you, know, if you have family, just, just imagine something. Just, just imagine something very simple. And imagine you're driving versus you're in the driver's seat. There's something very different about the feeling of can you handle a crazy car or something that is that is happening. So, so, so in some sense, being on the ground and in control with adaptation um, is, is psychologically easier. Thank you. Do you want to add something, Alessia? I can see it in your eyes. Yeah, yeah, you, you are absolutely correct. I wanted to add something from the experience of this April in Kiev, once Russians retreated from Kiev. Um, there, there were many international events going on, and people would ask me and my colleagues to abroad to join those events and that felt like a real extravaganza to go anywhere because you had the feeling that you are inside the history right now so that's probably a metaphorical way to say the same um you you are kind of staying in the most important place so going somewhere to less important places in such a situation is very uh, extravagant and also when people who 
I brought at the moment ask about uh, about the situation in Ukraine. The, there is one explanation which is very easily understood by Ukrainians. You would say it's like Maidan, and Maidan are those huge protests. It's much scarier uh, watching it on television than being inside. Once yeah. you're inside, you do not you are not scared all the time. You can get scared. But so this is probably uh, to illustrate what you've said. Yeah. Yeah, I can only support your words because I spent a couple of weeks in Ukraine. I'm really grateful for this experience because it opened to me such a lot of things I would never be able to imagine without actually leaving them out, which creates much more for understand. This is why it's so important to bring foreigner, I don't know, political persons, public persons, artists, right, just to experience that reality, which we are trying to share here. We have enormous number of uh, thank you comments about everything, about two types of stress, how to cope with each of them, what is secured attachment, how we can achieve it, sources of pride of Ukrainians and how those sources can help for resilience and how exhibition can add to resilience. Thank you for sharing it, dear Alessia, because it's an incredible example to think about how art can be a powerful tool, even in such an obvious situation under missile attacks, right? And my personal thanks to Dan for explaining why people doing social services are working harder when they are paid. It reminds me like my granddad would tell me, work like you are not paid for it. <laughs> that is exactly the case. And um, unpredictability of missile shelling legitimacy. And the most incredible thing we discovered about ourselves is resilience, and which allows Ukrainians not feeling helpless. Yeah, it's being busy arranging living conditions and gaining some control as a way to survive. And if, if you are as an intellectual asking yourself, what can I do today? Today, I think I would quote our guest as Yuri, there is never enough of support, as Oasis said. Stop denying things and just give a recognition to the language, to the country, to the culture, to the experience. Allow yourself to leave it out too and let Ukraine speak for themselves. This is what our dialogues are about. Why the perspective and mm, the un, not, you know, <laughs> honest answer and uh, questions. Thank you for both sides for answers and questions. Thank you for spending your time with us and um, this all would be not possible without the support of our partners. The US, US Embassy in Ukraine, Pan America, Ukrainian Institute, Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, Local History, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. And the gratitude, of course, to Pan Ukraine. We do hope that electricity will come back and you continue to stand on the front lines in the name of freedom and truth. We really appreciate your effort. And Pan International is proud to be a platform that supports freedom of expression. Thank you again. That was pure pleasure and great privilege, I should say. And uh, our dear viewers, stay with us. Next episode will be held on 15th of December, same time, 6 p.m. Kyiv time, 4 p.m. London time, and we'll be hosting Sofia Chalak. It's She is uh, the um, program director of Lviv Book Forum, the, one of the biggest literature festival and culture manager, and Margaret McMillan, who is a great researcher and author of really insightful books about the war nature. Follow our dialogues on war, spread the word, and stand with Ukraine. This is our shared responsibility today. Thank you for carrying it with us, Dan. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye,